side. So I wanted to start our talk off today uh, with a, uh, a, a hydrograph that sort of synthesizes some flow models that have been circulating for the past couple years. Uh, this was adapted uh, from some work Dave Herbst has done. And so um, this black line here kind of synthesizes a historical hydrograph and this gray one here is more of a current and expected uh, flow conditions in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. And I just want to highlight some things from, from uh, this projected hydrograph here. So we have these rain on snow floods that we uh, have been realizing for a while now uh, in the winter time. Uh, we have these uh, wetter and more erratic winter flows. We have a shift in, uh, to a peak in uh, snow melt to earlier in the year. Uh, and we have earlier in prolonged summer low flows. We have this uh, drying of perennial streams. Uh, I know some other people are going to talk about this later today. I've done some work on this. It's snarl, but um, a shift in flow regime from perennial to intermittent. Uh, and you know, these kinds of uh, shifts have implications toward the community assembly and food web dynamics in our aquatic systems. Uh, and the ones I really want to highlight are uh, changes in environmental process, uh, environmental conditions, whereby when you have a drying stream, you have uh, altered temperature cycle, dissolved oxygen cycle, and just cuts in dispersal ability. So these drying events uh, lead to uh, habitat constriction, which is also really important. So we kind of have these niche based and dispersal based disturbances, and I'm going to try to frame this talk in that light. So flow has kind of been considered a master variable for several decades now and it's kind of the centerpiece of uh, my research and so like I said I'm really interested in the shift of flow regimes and how that influences communities um, and so the picture on the left here is Strawberry Creek in the San Bernardino Mountains about nine years ago uh, here on the right hand side is Strawberry Creek um, three years ago same time of year uh, so these are the kind of radical shifts that we're realizing in um, many of our historically perennial streams. Uh, oh, and I kind of just wanted to get a census here. Uh, who loves uh, Nestle bottled water? <laughs> Raise your hand if you do. Oh, one person. All right. Uh, well, uh, this the this is where Nestle bottles their water. Um, this picture on the right hand side uh, is kind of what they they've been dealing with. They've been working on a several decade long expired permit uh, in uh, Forest Service land and we're trying to gain attention on this uh, catastrophe really and so uh, please uh, think about that next time you buy a Nestle bottled water. Uh, anyway, so uh, projects have been sort of focused on this alpha diversity framework which has been great. It's really taught us a lot. Um, I'm kind of trying to work on uh, the beta diversity framework for this talk. So here's just a quick uh, snapshot of, of some of the data I've been working with. This is South Lake Tahoe, El Dorado County. Uh, you can see some of these sites that I did not sample um, are at different elevations, uh, different spatial scales, and uh, these all have implications toward the functioning of our systems at the catchment scale. So uh, here's another snapshot of uh, some data I've been looking at. Uh, this is uh, richness on an uh, elevational contour plot. So the uh, the lighter the colors or the redder the colors, uh, the higher the richness, uh, the cooler or the bluer, the lower the richness. So we see some patterns here uh, in South Lake Tahoe. And here is uh, another quick snapshot of the data. This is um, percent endemism, you could call it, by stream order. And so there is some endemism expressed in, in this catchment that I'm talking about. Um, but what's driving these patterns? That's what I'm really curious about. What, what, why? Why, why is this stuff happening? So uh, to kind of get at that, I like to scale up, right? To look at to look at old catchments. So uh, here's a, uh, a NASA picture that ran through the LA Times a couple years ago, right? Um, of uh, shifts in snowpack. And so what I like, how I like to think about it is, you know. 
what's happening throughout the Sierra Nevada mountains at these different catchments and um, how can we analyze uh, relationships of beta diversity to flow perturbations and other environmental variables at these larger spatial scales. So the purpose of this talk, I define beta diversity as variation in community structure among a set of sample units within a given spatial temporal context. All right, so this leads to the basic study question of this project. Um, which flow-related environmental processes and or spatial scales best predict community turnover in the Sierra Nevada? Uh, this is kind of a lofty goal and um, so I, I, I have not answered this question uh, quite yet with this talk, but I'm trying to get there and uh, I'm going to show you some preliminary analyses. So uh, how do we study aquatic communities in light of perturbations? Well, we know that BMIs are great, EPTs are awesome, um, and uh, functional trait niches are a great way to go uh, when we're looking at uh, uh, responses of communities to perturbations. So that's another avenue I've taken with my work. Um, uh, in this project, uh, pretty much the methods that uh, we used, uh, we formed a database, we did some ordinations, and we employed variation partitioning techniques to link environmental and spatial variables at uh, larger scales. So how did we do this? Uh, this is kind of my connection to this uh, meeting is uh, uh, I utilize the CETA network uh, and swamp data uh, for this project. So, um, yeah. And then uh, I utilized a bunch of gauge data for my flow variables uh, and assembled a bunch of predictors from various databases. And uh, for this study, uh, I focused uh, uh, in uh, Lower Lake Tahoe, and the idea is to kind of start here and hopefully scale up to other catchments once we kind of nail down a protocol. So this is pretty much where uh, the sites are uh, for the uh, purpose of this talk. And um, just going through some uh, preliminary data here, um, this is uh, temperature variation among sites. Uh, so there's some variability here. We have some cooler areas, some warmer areas. Um, this is uh, uh, 30 year coefficient of variation. So what I did was I pulled 30 years of flow data, uh, daily flow data, and then I calculated a coefficient of variation uh, over those that 30 year time span um, to kind of contextualize uh, the hydrograph uh, to the uh, swamp data that we pulled uh, from these different sites. So uh, how do we analyze beta diversity where we, uh, we use the Bray Curtis method to calculate beta diversity and then conducted a distance based uh, redundancy analysis uh, to partition the environmental and spatial variables. Uh, so this is what the results are going to look like when I present them. We're going to have this Venn diagram sort of thing. Um, the green circle is going to be the proportion of variation explained by the environment. The blue is uh, pure space. So anything, in, uh, the numbers in the blue circle are essentially, you know, what uh, that, uh, anything that space describes completely. And then the intersection of the two is uh, structurally, uh, spatially structured environmental variables. Um, and obviously we have unexplained uh, variation as we do usually with these analyses. So this is what we found so far. Um, uh, pure environment explains about 3%, uh, pure space explains about 4%, uh, and spatially uh, structured environmental variables explain about uh, 15 or so. So um, we're not explaining too much of the variation right now going on uh, in the uh, catchment with this procedure, uh, but uh, this was done using a taxonomic method, so we're not using traits uh, in this slide and um, actually this is kind of usually what people get using this method so we're not too far off. Uh, and the significant environmental variables we found were elevation, stream order, and uh, coefficient of flow variation. So just to kind of dive deeper into the, those results, um, on the left-hand side here, we have a non-metric uh, multidimensional scaling ordination of uh, sites uh, in low and high elevation uh, areas. And uh, when we do a permutation F-test on the PCOA of, of uh, those data, we find a significant difference. So um, 
So there is something going on here, and the environmental variables are definitely important in dictating the, the patterns that we're seeing. So, so what do these results mean? Well, we know that uh, these spatially structured environmental processes are, are most important from this first uh, sort of preliminary pass. Uh, so we know species sorting uh, could be uh, explaining some of the variation that we're seeing. Um, and unstructured spatial effects seem weak so far, so pure space is not really dictating uh, much of what we're finding. Uh, so what am I doing right now? Well, coefficient of variation is an interesting metric, but um, as uh, we know, there are a, a lot of different aspects of the hydrograph that could be um, sort of dictating the patterns that we're seeing. So um, I'm using uh, some uh, techniques to uh, find which aspects of the hydrograph are most predictive of the patterns we're seeing. Uh, so that's kind of the direction I want to take with this project. Uh, and using in stream distances and functional turnover. So uh, Andy sent me uh, a, a, a database of uh, traits exhibited by most swamp taxa that have been identified. Uh, and I'm working on a clustering analysis to uh, sort of group the traits that we're finding into um, certain interesting uh, uh, communities. And then uh, what we're doing is looking for which traits are most uh, related to the environmental variables. And then we're going to redo this variation partitioning analysis with those significant traits uh, against the environmental variables to see what's going on. Uh, so the overall mission for this project, uh, which we really haven't quite addressed yet, is you know how can we address the problem of changing flow regimes? Um, and uh, hopefully, with the help of a lot of collaborators and some more sort of fine-tuned work with uh, Swamp data set, we can start to understand which aspects of the flow regime are dictating the patterns that we're seeing. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, all the people that have helped with this project. Um, it's taken some time uh, learning about the way Swamp works and